Welcome to Women Read Scripture. I'm Mariana Richardson. And I'm Annette Marie Lantos Tilleman Dick. And it's so wonderful being with you today. We're going to be talking about Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John 5 and 6, which are such rich and wonderful chapters. Oh, they are. It's such a privilege to be able to go into these scriptures in depth. I'm so grateful. It is. We're going to be talking in John 5 to start off with an amazing story that all of us are very familiar with. It's the man that is um, healed at the Pool of Bethesda. And you say it correctly. You say it in the Hebrew, so I would love well, to have you say it. It Bet Hasda, Bet Hasda, and Bet always means house, house of. And Hasda means mercy, but it really means completely undeserved kindness oh, and generosity. Completely undeserved kindness and generosity. I love that expanded definition of mercy, because that's what mercy is. Well, and we have this beautiful story that happens where Jesus does show exactly that, that definition of mercy, and that you have this man who, in the Pool of Bethesda, as soon as they see a little quaking of the water, the first person to hop in is going to supposedly be healed. And of course, he is sitting there, but unable to put himself into the water. And so he looks up to the Savior because he doesn't have anybody else to help him and kind of, I'm sure, beseechingly asks the Savior to help him place him in the water. And we have this, this beautiful kind of a back and forth where uh, the, Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. 38 it, years. It's so long. I mean, I just can't imagine just that hope for that long. And the impotent man answered him saying, Sir, I have no man to help me when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So I love it. He is not having any mercy. Nobody is helping him. And that is when um, the Savior turns to him and Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And that is the problem that happens. And we see that over and over again. I know you talked about that just last week, about this problem of healing on the Sabbath day and what the Pharisees felt about that. It, it, it's, it's so interesting, that juxtaposition. I want to back go back for a moment, though, to this place, Betz Hasda, uh -huh. the house of mercy, where we do not see too much mercy being exercised. <laughs> I mean, this man has been coming for 38 years, and nobody has thought in this house of mercy to help him into this Isn't pond at the moment that? or the, the pool at the moment that they believe that healing takes place. I all, I sort of wonder about that, you know, did healing really take place? It sounds like so many people were there. Who's going to follow up to find out, you know, whether they really Somebody were healed or <laughs> not? You know what I mean? In. Yeah. Um, you don't know, but but they were there in faith, believing that in this house of mercy, these miraculous healings could happen. And how paradoxical that as so many are seeking healing, the Pharisees continue to use the Savior healing the clearly, clearly profoundly challenged individuals, whether it's this man who is lying there and can't get himself to the pool, or the woman who is bent over, or the person with the shriveled hand. Right. One after another, these are clearly serious handicaps. And when on this day, this beautiful day of rest that has been set aside by the Lord for rest. The Savior heals individuals for whom there is no rest from these handicaps. Oh, definitely. What these self-righteous, faithful followers of the scriptures jump on is that he that is this is not lawful to right. heal on the sabbath or in that case the first the first issue was that he the man got up and he took up his bed, the bed they're like walking and instead of anybody saying 
what happened? <laughs> How you're you're healed?" Right. And it was apparently okay to go into the pool when the, but he was healed. Right. He was obviously healed, but he, he's carrying his bed, you know. Right. And um, and and there's another interesting aspect to it that I think is very telling, and that is, he says, "He who." told me to rise up, told me to carry my bed, and that's why right, I'm carrying it. Right. They said, who is it? They said, well, I don't really know. I don't know. There must have been a lot of people there, and he didn't right. know. So he didn't go back to thank him, you know, I guess, as some people did. But later, he, he identifies him, him right. and the fury that it engenders. Mm -hmm. When he says the name. He that's right. Who healed him. Well, and I think it's really interesting, too, when we talk about the Sabbath, for me, the Sabbath day, because it is a day of rest, is also a day of healing because of that rest. Very much. It is It is the day that helps me to heal from those other six worldly days totally. that I, I'm able to have that day to heal spiritually. And so that's another reason why I think it's very interesting that after we have this problem, especially with John, John kind of brings up the paradox where he says very, you know, he says, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. I mean, so it's not just, you know, being upset. It's no. they want to kill him because of it. it, it the paradox, I mean, you know, paradox, I mean, I think it's Jared Halverson always talks about contraries and paradox is another way of referring to that. Two things that don't seem that they can fit together. They are so worried about the Savior doing things on the Sabbath day that are not lawful according to the interpretation of how you sell exactly. you were honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. At the same time, they want to kill him because that is repeatedly mentioned right. for not abiding by a man-made definition of what is and isn't permitted on the Sabbath day. So right there, there's a real problem. Well, and not only that, but also think that the Savior was Jehovah of the Old Testament. And so he was the one that initially of gave course. that, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And yet they are the ones that are going to kill him for breaking the Sabbath day. And so we have this interesting part that happens after this, you know, Pula Bethesda issue that happens where Jesus tries to teach the people who he really is and his relationship with his father. And so he's, he, Jesus answered them after he's saying they're going to slay him. He says, my father worketh hitherto, and I work, meaning on the Sabbath day. Therefore, the Jews sought more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And then answered Jesus and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So we have these, these beautiful words about the relationship between the Father and Son. And I, I love in, that, in the next verse, I think, um, Mariana, he says, If I bear witness of myself, um, my witness is not true, which is an interesting thing to say. I thought about it a lot, and I realized that Jesus, even though we know that Jesus is Jehovah, he is the creator, he created the Sabbath, he is Lord of the Sabbath, and he boldly states that. Right. Nevertheless, he has taken the form of a man, and as a human being, he has his own ego, as it were, that wants to do what he, that reacts, that would react in his way. I mean, what we bow down and reverence is that the Savior always submitted his will to the, the Father's. The Father, definitely. And, and it seems a little complicated, but it's very powerful for us to understand this difference, that he knew that it was important that the Father bore witness of him. It wasn't only that he bore witness, and that he, his calling was to come to earth and to judge for the father. He says, as I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not mine own. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the father, which has sent, which hath sent me. Um, 
if I witness of myself, my witness is not true. And I, I love that the Savior, there are these two things. There is his own will and the will of the Father. And his calling is to at every step submit his will to the Father. And here is this great all-knowing man who people want. I mean, we say the devil, but it was also probably part. He could have been ruler of, you know, he had the tools to have people bow down to him right. in that way. Um, but he chose not to because that was not his calling. His calling was to come and do the will of his father. And it it sort of made me think of that prayer of, and I was going to look it up, but I didn't, you know, that they say was on St. Peter's. It's like, God, give me the um, courage to change the things that need to be changed that I can change and to accept the things that will cannot be changed and the wisdom to know the difference. And I feel like Jesus sort of puts this before us. Father, give us the courage to understand thy will and to understand our will and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, that we also have that challenge that the Savior modeled for us perfectly of understanding what is our will and what is the Lord's will. And we have the tools through the Holy Spirit and through prayer to help us know the difference. I also love that unity. And when we talk about the fact that both of them, you know, basically the son submits his will to the father. And because of that, that's how they become as one. And a matter of fact, um, in, in verse 20 of, of chapter five, he says, for the father loveth the son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. And I love the fact that, you know, basically the love, it's the love that also brings them together, that he's he's doing this out of love for his father. And that unity comes from love as well. And that love from his father is the love he has for creation as well. And for, for us, us right? for us, and as we conform our will to their will, to his will we also can have that oneness in our lives. Exactly. You know, that is from whence issues, the peace, the well-being, the, the strength in the storm, all of that. Well, the other thing that kind of struck me is if you go to the very end of this chapter, if we look at especially um, verses 34, 35, and 36, we have some interesting Joseph Smith translation changes oh. in these verses. And I just wanted to point them out because I think it goes along with your your point about the testimony that he was not saying this testimony of myself. So, you know, if we go and we say, well, I'm so great, I'm so, you know, I, I am the, you know, the son of the father. He's saying, look, it's not, I am not testifying of this. But he first points out that John testified of this because John did. I know. And he said, but I receive not, and this is verse 34, and I'm reading the Joseph Smith translation. Mm. And he says, and he, meaning John, received not his testimony of man, but of God. And ye yourselves say that he is a prophet, meaning John the Baptist. Therefore, ye ought to receive his testimony. These things I say that ye may be saved. And then he goes on to verse 36. This is the Joseph Smith translation. But I have a greater witness than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father have given me to finish, the same works what I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And this goes back to, you know, look at my works. Look at what I'm accomplishing. We go back to that beautiful Isaiah scripture when he read in his hometown synagogue, you know, those beautiful words of Isaiah. And he says, today is this scripture fulfilled. And it talks about all the things that the way he's going to bring sight to the blind and help those that are, you know, can't hear to hear. And so he is doing those things. And he says, look, look at what I'm doing. I'm accomplishing the work of my father. This, this kind of epitomizes that, um, dichotomy, which is not a dichotomy really, of the Savior who is so humble 
Nothing was of himself. It was all doing his father's will. And yet he knew that this was his calling. Mm -hmm. He knew he was the anointed son of God. He was the Christ. And he declared that boldly in the midst of his true humility as a man, which he had become, to subject his will at every turn to the Father, to do the Father's will. And we know that they were one in that. And yet, I mean, this is just an insight I had as I've been really studying this this time. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus was a man, he still had reactions that were based in our humanness. Right. But he, he recognized those and subjected those to the test. Is it my will or the Father's? We talk turning stone into bread at that moment. Right. He could do it. He waited. He could do he it. Waited cause but he waited. he knew it wasn't his Father's will. Right. Jumping off and just having that nice big show, you know, that people would have definitely no, 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 you know, this, right. this is, this is it, you know, <laughs> wasn't his father's will, right. you know, and, and Simon, you know, all of these things that he knew and ultimate, well, we will talk about that later, you know, but I, there are more things <laughs> that, that fall into that category. So, you know, I, I wondered that had this question, what does it mean to trust one's father's will so much, um, that to do it is one's great goal, to only do one's Father's will? Oh, I think that is such a beautiful question. You know, two thoughts come into my mind. First of all, as we talk about this is, you know, John 17, which is the beautiful intercessory prayer that the Savior gives, you know, before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and his final crucifixion. Um, for me, those that experience of him expressing that oneness and being willing to know in, you know, as you talk about his humanness, it wasn't like he wasn't going to feel pain and agony. The fact that he was human, he would feel those things. And I would say probably more so than we mere humans because yes. he was more than yes. human. And so he probably felt more sensitive. More, more sensitive. And so as I, I think of that, I, I think of that willingness to be submitted to such a, which he knew how horrible it was going to be. You know, Mariana, what you're saying is so, it, 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 it's so meaningful to me because I do think that that is where the rubber meets the road in terms of our father's will and our own, when the hard things cannot be avoided. Oh, when the Lord who does unfold miracles before us in so many ways, I know in my life, in each of our lives, if we're looking there are miracles that we experience, wonderful things that happen that we couldn't imagine would happen. And then there are the times when we desperately would like something that seems appropriate mm -hmm. to happen. We'd like a marriage to work. We'd like a business venture to that we poured ourselves into <laughs> to prosper. We would like a very good person to live and not die. And that isn't what happens. And those are the times when we have this opportunity to seek to understand our Father's will and to align ourselves with it in a way that will allow us to move forward in faith. And, I, you know? I, I love that. And especially the fact that we talk about the love the other scripture that just comes to mind when we talk about this unity is Abinadi's beautiful um, Abinadi's discourse perfect. that he gave about the Father and the Son. And I just wanted to read this in the Book of Mormon because as we've talked about this, I always like to bring in the Latter-day Scripture I love as we talk about the New Testament and show how we gain more understanding about some of these concepts as we look to the Book of Mormon, as we look to the Doctrine and Covenants, and our Latter-day Prophets. But this is what Abinadi says, And because he, meaning the Savior, dwelleth in flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, 
being the Father and the Son. The Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son, because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son. I don't know. I just find the Book of Mormon to be the most brilliant commentary on both the Old and the New Testament. I agree. And um, I, I, having been more familiar with the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you know, coming to the Book of Mormon, experiencing it as a revealed additional testament of Christ, um, I. I just, sometimes those stories, I know with sometimes with kids who are raised in the church, those stories are the most familiar to them. To me, they are not always the most familiar. I know them well, but they are so illuminating. That is so illuminating, that whole com discussion of why Jesus was the father and the son and the, the nature of his flesh and that making, giving him this differentiation from that divine will that had to be put into harmony with it. I, that's beautiful. Thank you, Mark. And that goes so along with your thoughts about the fact that the Savior did have a physical body. And as a physical body, he was subject to pain, to hunger, to you know some of these raw emotions that all of us have to deal with. And yet he was willing to subject those to the will of his father, which is pretty amazing. You know, I was thinking about what are the tools we have um, to to um, help us understand what is our will, what is the father's will, and um, in in I'm, I should have it right at my fingertips, but in um, our readings today, one of the things that the Savior says in John, I think it's John six, he says. Um, no, John 5, he says, you have the scriptures, mm -hmm. study the scriptures. They are they which testify of me. Um, and I, and um, we do have the scriptures as a great tool to guide us. What are, we have other tools to guide us to understand our, our Father's will and measure our will with that. I mean, I'm so grateful in the latter days that we have prophet on the earth who is so inspired and gives us such profound and tuned in guidance for our lives oh, right now. And, and this is a way that we can test oftentimes our own questions, you know, of mm -hmm. our will versus the Father's will. We have prayer, we have the scriptures, and we have our latter day leaders to guide us and direct us. Well, and as we talk about this, the fact that all of us are very human, some of us are, are more human than others. I know um, the next story we're going to talk about is this idea of feeding the 5,000. And and it's kind of funny, as I was looking at this story, I kind of, uh, anybody who knows me knows I do not like to cook. <laughs> and And that's kind of funny for people because I always have hordes at my house with 12 children and 30 grandchildren. So when I'm doing a dinner, it is not just for a couple of people. It's, you know, I usually count it in terms of, you know, in numbers of 10, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40. And so I, this idea of feeding the 5,000, I kind of get it in terms of that's kind of how I feel, being overwhelmed by these hordes that they had to find food for. <laughs> oh, always, always, Don't you know. You feel that way? Well, totally, you know. A great I'm, cook, well, but let I, me put it this I'm way. No, I'll it. say that I cooked a lot over the years, and I was very grateful that my children had the flexibility to start learning to cook quite early, and I would oh, hand nice. it off to them. And I will say that now my children, all of them, even if they're business leaders, if they're academic, you know, brilliant, what they all love to cook and they're very good cooks. And so I still do my regular things, but I do not branch out anymore. <laughs> and I, I am very grateful to cook less than I cooked for a long period of time. But I love this thing where the, his disciples come to and Jesus say, and say, the time is now past. Let's send them away. Yeah. People I, are hungry, and, <laughs> and we don't have any. Philip says 200 penny worth. I mean, these are 
not wealthy men, and they're saying, look, there's no way we can pay for getting bread for all these people. And But this part, I think, is interesting. This is verse 9. I love it. Basically, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto them, there is a, a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? My thoughts as I read it this time was on the lad. Yes. Because you know that this young man, probably that was all the food he had, and who knows how long that food was supposed to last him, and yet he had the faith to give up his small little portion to supposedly feed all these people, but I'm sure, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying this, this lad probably had a lot more faith than I do. I guess that's the thing I'm saying. I think I'm it, so impressed. I love that you zeroed in on that because that is one of the things I really wanted to just mention that the Savior at some point may ask us to give up our five barley loaves and two fishes. And are we ready to do it? Yeah. That was his whole meal for, he probably had come from afar. People had come from afar. He had this this little bit of food to sustain him. And he was, he was willing. Probably hungry. You know, yeah, he the, was probably hungry. The faith that brought him there was clearly the real deal because he was willing to give it up. And I think when we are asked to give up something, it's so good to reference this little lad and what he gave up and what the Lord was able to, to do, do with, with what he oh, gave up. I agree. And I think that's sometimes how some of us feel is not only is, you know, this enough, but also I'm giving my all, but compared to the task the Lord has asked me to do, I know that that little bit that I'm giving is, there's no way it can take care of everything. But the Lord magnifies what we're able to give, especially if we give our all. And that's the big thing. You know, I, I the lad didn't hold back one of the fish. You know, he didn't hold back one of the loaves. Instead, he gave every little bit of food that he had to the Savior. It is making me cry a little bit because I know that I've seen this in my own life, Mariana. And one of the things that I think I would love to sort of testify to is that it doesn't happen right away. And we can be giving our all day after day week after week, month after month, and not feel a sense of security mm -hmm. that the things that we hope we are prospering with all of this are actually prospering. In my life, I know, I, I feel maybe I should just say, you know, for many years, I made this decision when I was very young, when my first child was not quite five, when it wasn't a thing, really, mm -hmm. I had only I only read a theoretical passage about it in a book that I was going to try to teach my kids at home, and I will say that I got a lot of pushback from a lot of people. I was, you know, I was sort of had been a part of the educational establishment in certain ways. I had a teacher's credential. My father was a professor. My mother was a teacher. My father had worked for the National Education Association. Um, you know, we were very traditional education people. Right. Though I will say my parents enriched my life enormously. And that was one of the reasons I chose to try to teach my children at home because I felt like I had learned so much from all the enrichment that my parents had provided. I thought that it, I might be able to do that better if I wasn't torn in many directions mm -hmm. because I already had quite a few children when I started. Sure. Um, but I threw myself into it and I really didn't feel like I was doing such a great job a lot of the time. I had a lot of insecurity surrounding it, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of pushback. My wonderful father, who was brilliant, would call me almost every day to say, <laughs> I don't know why you are doing this. You are, I don't know how these children are going to ever function. And it wasn't for many years. And then, you know, when they were actually quite young, they started college and they did quite well. And then... And I have met many of your children, and they are all brilliant, I mean, with a capital B. And so obviously it worked, and the Lord helped you but out in this. I didn't, I wasn't sure, I loved them, but I wasn't sure. 
that it was going to work. And at a certain point, I realized everything the Lord had seen, all my extremely inadequate efforts, but it was everything I had. And that is the truth of it. I knew how inadequate my efforts were. But he met me way more than halfway oh, I love it. to allow my efforts to yield. To me, it was like feeding the 5,000, you know? Well, and I, uh, Sister Michelle Craig gave a wonderful talk, and she said, you and I can give what we have to Christ, and he will multiply our efforts, just like you were describing. What you have to offer is more than enough, even with your human frailties and weaknesses, if you rely on the grace of God. And then she went on to talk about Elder Neil A. Maxwell called this divine discontent. And divine discontent comes when we compare what we are to what we have the power to become. And obviously, I have a lot of divine discontent <laughs> because all of us feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. I'm, I'm not where I feel like I should be. But if we give our all to the Lord, he will make up the difference, just like you were describing. I, I love that qu that phrase, are we, that I'm not quite there yet. You know, you think of the children when you're traveling in a car, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, we aren't there yet. We're not But we just got to, we got to stay in the car and keep moving and we'll get there, you know? Oh, definitely. Well, we have Jesus also invites us to set aside these fears. And we have this great story about Peter and walking on the water. Oh, this story. I mean, it's so... Wonderful. I love, you know, I love that after he fed the 5,000, this incredible miracle, of course, everybody wants to follow him. And he sends his, this, his disciple, his apostles, uh, disciples away at this point. He says, just get in this boat and go. And he, he, in one of the, um, one of the gospels, it says that he knows they want to make him king. Right. right. They want to give him that power, which he knows is not his father's will. And he retires to a mountain. He retires, he goes up on a mountain to be alone. And I, I think that that is so valuable for each of us. We aren't the savior, but we do need to take time to be alone, to put our priorities back into shape, to, over, to, to see with clarity our purpose, which he does. Meanwhile, his Disciples are on in the ship on the water and experiencing a terrible storm, and it's very miserable. And at the fourth watch, they say, um, which is, I think, four o'clock in the morning. Right, between three and six. Yeah, um, um, about. They look and they see someone, because they don't recognize him at first, on the walking on the water. And... There are different things. He always says, be not afraid. But I love where he says, be of good cheer. <laughs> it is I. Be not afraid. I love that reminder to not only not be afraid, but to be of good cheer. Oh, that is wonderful. I We have a dear friend, Vern Kendall. He worked with my husband for a long time. And Vern had many challenges in your, his life. But whenever I would talk to Vern and say, hey, Vern, how are you? And I'd know something pretty challenging had happened. Vern would say, couldn't be better. Oh, I love and that. I love that ability. I have a lovely young woman who works with me, Dallas, and I'll say, how are you, Dallas? And I know she has many challenges. She's like, fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I take that as a wonderful gift, this ability through the thick and the thin, to be of good cheer. And I love that. And this moment, at that moment when they think, you know, th things are going crazy. There's a storm. Uh, there's a horrible storm. Right. That be of good cheer. I am here. It is I. I love that. And I, I love then that Peter, once he recognizes it, says, let me come to thee. If, if it is you, let me come to thee. Yeah. You know, this, isn't this what we all want? We want to come to the Lord. So he steps out, steps out onto the water, which it's could pretty feel incredible. Yeah, right? pretty miraculous. Stepping out, right. and you know where and men don't sink go at the beginning doesn't sink. No, 
And then he looks around and sees everything and begins to sink. And the Savior says, you need to have more faith. You need to have more faith. I think this is a great lesson for us in life. You know, I'm thinking even of my sweet father who was not a devout man on earth, though I think he was certainly led by the Spirit in much that he accomplished and much that he did. But he used to say, because, you know, he came to America as a penniless immigrant after a harrowing set of life experiences. He accomplished a lot, but he used to say, I just put my foot out in thin air and then bring the other one up to meet it. Oh, I love it. And I love this because my dad may not have understood what his faith was in, but he somehow had faith to push himself forward to accomplish things that were important. And I believe that many of the things he accomplished were the Lord's will in this life, you know? Um, I think that this is for us too, that we need to have faith and we need to hold on to that faith and move forward in faith. I agree. A matter of fact, I just have a kind of a funny story about this in that um, (laughs) when I was... When I was young, when I was uh, I was probably 10 years old, it was after I was baptized. And we lived in California at that point, and my parents had a big pool in the backyard. And I had just been reading this story of Peter. And I just thought within myself, I, I just w- was contemplating and just said, well, maybe if I have enough faith, you know, I could walk on this water. And, and it was, it was such a, a stark reality, of course, when I stepped out and fell right down to the, to the bottom of the pool. But you could swim, right? But I, yeah, but I could swim. <laughs> yeah, it was just fine. I could swim. But I, I think sometimes, too, I learned from, from that. It, initially, I was like, well, maybe I didn't have enough faith. You know, maybe, maybe I just, you know, just like Peter, maybe I didn't have enough faith. But I also learned about this, that, that doing the Lord's will. I, wasn't do, I was doing something that I just wanted to, to see if I could do it. You know, I wasn't doing the will of the Lord. I wasn't seeking his will in order for this miracle to happen. And, and I think that's also something that I learned from that experience as well. But, you know, Mariana, I love that with your childlike understanding of these stories— you, I mean, this is a perfect story for a child who, when she was baptized at eight, knew it was true and never has faltered. You know, that has been <laughs> her path. That you read this miracle and you thought, okay, let's, let's try, try it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love I, it. And it didn't shake my faith. I guess that's the thing, too, that we need to see about this is that even though, you know, the Savior kind of chastises Peter afterwards, Peter's faith does not falter. If anything, I think it strengthens Peter's faith and enables him to be stronger in his faith. And allows him to acknowledge where he let go, where fear entered in and how fear can obstruct our goals. And I think that it's really important, you know, I love the story of you stepping on the water in the swimming (laughs) pool. I love it. But I love it for a reason also that is... um, that is a broader understanding because, you know, when Jesus comes both to, um, to Nazareth and to other places where they want him to do the miracles they've seen in places, he said, he says, no, you know, I, I, that is not, it is not for me to do those miracles here. Right. And, and he also chastises them for wanting him. I mean, in the scriptures we're reading today, they say, do some miracles now to show us. Yeah. And he's like, it is wrong to demand miracles. That's not miracles. why I do miracles. That's right. Right. You know? Well, and after after this miracle, I mean, this is a perfect example in John 6, because he's fed the 5,000. And after feeding the 5,000, you know, we already had that little interlude where they want to make him king and he goes off by himself. Yeah. But the next day, a whole bunch of people start following him again. Now, he even acknowledges, he says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And if you look at the Joseph Smith translation, it says, because ye desire, you know, it's so ye seek me not because you desire to keep my sayings. That's the translation. That's, but that's the, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I don't know. 
why I didn't read the Joseph Smith translations of these because they're so good. Yes. I mean, helping can you read? I mean, read that one more time because it's so good, Mariana. <laughs> that you because it elab it shows how that translation clarifies with such simplicity so, what the point of the Savior's message is. Yeah, you seek me not because you desire to keep my sayings, neither because you saw the miracles, so but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. So you're just here for another snack. Uh, another snack, to... another watch you do this. And cool it's thing. not a fish of miracles. It's more of a show. It's a show and what we get from the show. And not because you desire to do my sayings. And clearly, we see over and over again when he says, you know, who are my brother and my mother? And those who do my, my will. will. Yeah. Those who do the things that I'm explaining. Those who understand and do it, you know. And um, I love that Joseph Smith translation piece. Thank you so much for sharing it. Well, then he goes on to give us the Bread of Life sermon, which for me is such a beautiful piece of scripture. And it is something that I love to read when I'm partaking of the sacrament. Mm -hmm. For me, it, it does almost bring tears to my eyes every time I think about it, because um, it helps me understand more than anything else what the sacrament is supposed to do for me. It is supposed to change me completely inside and out, inside especially. And that's the reason why I think it's fascinating to see what happens when he says these words. They are not ready to hear his sayings. And so this is truly a turning point for many of his disciples. So he says right here, then Jesus said unto them, he's talking about the manna from heaven. And he said, okay, the children of Israel, when they're wandering in the, you know, 40 days and 40 nights into the wilderness, Basically, they were given manna from heaven. And then Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So he's really declaring himself here in terms of who he is. Very boldly, very clearly. And now it's interesting because the people say, Well, Lord evermore give us this bread. And of course, they're thinking the physical bread, you know, like Moses, who every day they got their food, you know, they didn't have to worry about it. And I'm sure many of these people were poor and hungry, wanting that. Kind they of were working, they worked very hard for the bread that they ate, probably. Right. And they were looking forward to more, you know, freebies yes. kind of a thing. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And then after saying all this, the Jews then murmured at him because they said, you know, he, I am the bread of heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? You know, I'm going to make a little comment here. I think that, you know, the scriptures have gone through many translations and mm -hmm. some translations, um, and there are times there's there was a point in the history of the scriptural presentation where they it became a Gentile thing. And because actually, as we know, Jesus was a Jew. His yeah. followers were all Jewish, right. all of the people who believed. So I think that when it says that in the script you know where I mean where it says the Jews I think that unfortunately that terminology has been used to foment anti-semitism through the ages no, and I we need an to be careful I, I know that I have sometimes been in classes where I have flinched a little bit mm -hmm. because I'm like guess what Jesus was a Jew guess what all the apostles Jews guess what all the people who are following him the large majority, there were others. He made a point because he came to the Jewish people and many of them did embrace him and take forward his gospel. Um, but, so I'm sorry to stop on that point, no, which I, I know is, an important but point. I will say that this is an important point to me because, and I know it's an important point to many. I know that um, that, that 
it's really a later accretion of the gospel mm -hmm. because, in fact, in the early editions, they were written by Jews. Right. And so, but there were amongst them, just like there is in every religious community, those who understand the actual point of what religion is supposed to be, which is the love of God, God's mercy, God's kindness, God's hope for us to return, to be with him. And then there are those who make it a matter of pride. And unfortunately, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees made their mastery of how to do what to do a matter of pride. So I'm sorry to... No, no, that's a wonderful. And I, and I think that's really true as we continue reading the New Testament that we always think about that, that we do not, um, you know, categorize. And we all have a tendency to have that judgmental kind of a personality that we're careful also as we read the scriptures about that. But so then the Savior, you know, continues this beautiful sermon. And the question is, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? You know, and this goes back to Christine's <laughs> comment about sometimes you might look at this as cannibalism. And they're kind of asking that question. Well, of, it is a little confusing. Yeah. Right? Why is he saying that? And and so the Savior says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So there's this question of people not understanding this whole concept of I am the bread of life and realize they haven't had the sacrament yet. And so a lot of these things were were things that they, they were questioning. But, All of them were not completely understanding what the Savior was saying. I mean, we they do at Pesach, you know, you at a Passover, right. you are taking the matzah, you're eating it, and it is a symbol. You know, it's an important of symbol. Exactly. exactly. This and this and happens right all, at Passover. That's right. That's when this and is happening. I mean, this is the truth here, that I was reading it at one point, and I was thinking, well, no wonder they got confused. It is pretty confusing. But if you see it, the whole arc, if you understand the miracles that are being wrought, the, the great love of God that is causing one deeply... Um, I, I, I don't want to say a handicapped person who, you know, a person, one deeply challenged person after another to have these physical challenges right. lifted from them as they are told you are forgiven too. That the Lord is blessing them to be go, to go forward with a new heart as well as a new body. And he's doing it over and over again. And instead of understanding what is in front of them, they are picking on the way that the Sabbath is being right. honored. Right. And, and so they don't understand what they see or what they hear. The words could be difficult to understand. The, the words could. And, and I want to go back to your point that this did happen right after Passover. And the fact that at the beginning of the sermon, he specifically talks about Moses and is bringing that imagery of the Passover, bringing the imagery of the manna. And so he's really trying to, in this sermon, bringing them from the Old Testament to the New Testament, to the new covenant that he's trying to bring them to, which is the symbol of the sacrament, which is the new covenant that he's bringing to these people. And it's amazing how many people are open to this and how many people really struggle from the old covenant to the new covenant. And and I think that what and it, the Lord feels frustrated that those who have studied the most, the scribes, who have copied these scriptures over and over, over again. again. They know them. Right. And I understand how, because as you read the Old Testament carefully and closely, it does testify of Christ. And it's not only this scripture here and that scripture there. The teachings are woven throughout the Old Testament. And here comes the embodiment of them. And he is frustrated that they do not recognize, recognize him. him. You know, and that, that the simple and poor do. Yeah. And so this also goes to um, Elder Christofferson gave a wonderful talk about the bread which came down from heaven. And he says, to eat his flesh 
and drink his blood is a striking way of expressing how completely we must bring the Savior into our life, into our very being, that we may be one, going back to that becoming one with the will of the Father, have spoken of receiving. We have to receive the Savior's atoning grace to take away our sins and the stain of those sins in us. But figuratively, eating his flesh and drinking his blood has a further meaning, and that is to internalize the qualities and character of Christ, putting off the natural man and becoming saints through the atonement of Christ the Lord. That's so beautiful. I love that. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to internalize, you know, so this is this partaking of the sacrament. And that's the reason why I say I love reading John 6, the, this beautiful sermon, as I partake of the sacrament, to think and ponder, am I going towards this new covenant? Am I internalizing the Savior's teachings and becoming more like him as I partake of the sacrament? Because that's what the covenant that we're making when we partake of the sacrament. That's right. So the other thing that happens at the end of this is many, many, many of these disciples walk away from the Savior after this beautiful sermon. Hard. It, I mean, some of it's hard to understand. And some of it is hard to understand. And then the Savior, after seeing Isn't these people, say, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? And that is a question I think all of us need to ask ourselves when we come like you were saying, through those hard and difficult times in our lives where maybe we don't understand exactly what the Lord is doing in our lives and how the Lord, you know, why can the Lord do this to me? We have that question, especially when bad things happen. Um, but Peter's answer is something all of us can say. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. One thing that I've really enjoyed, and I, I know I keep on bringing up Edersheim, but oh, um, I will say this, that it's been fun to reread him as we're reading the New Testament. I just, um, his his book, Jesus the Christ, is just uh, one, Jesus, Jesus the Messiah is just one of my favorites. But he talks very specifically about Peter's statement and how each one of us, he always talks about, this is something we need to internalize. He said, it is thus also that many of us whose thoughts may have been sorely tossed and whose foundations terribly assailed may have found our first resting place in the assured, unassailable spiritual experience of the past, whither we go for words of eternal life, if not to Christ. If he fails us, then all hope of the eternal is gone. But... He has the words of eternal life. And we believed when they first came to us. Nay, we know that he is the Holy One of God. And this conveys all that faith needs for further learning. The rest will he show when he is transfigured in our sight. That's, Isn't that beautiful? It's so beautiful, Mariana. And it reminds, it, I just, as you were reading it, I thought about, and it's hard not to cry, the moment when our little baby died of sudden infant death when my husband went into the bedroom and he realized that there was something terribly wrong and he called the I we called the EMTs and you know they came and um but my husband was caught he tried to resuscitate him and and I was there with six of my children around me and it was such a devastating moment and I realized in that moment exactly what Edersheim said where, to whom else can we go? Exactly. To what else can I turn but to the Lord? In the same moment, I was like, how can this be happening? And my children around me, and I realized, you have to go to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You have to go in absolute faith because that is where your hope lies as well. And my experience my experience. And, you know, I know people can rationalize it away, say, well, yes, that, you know, I mean, it's a comfortable thing. But all I know is that I've lived without 
a distinct faith in Christ. And I know that I have lived with one. And I know that with that faith, I have gone through many deep trials. Mm -hmm. And that that faith has held, the rope has held, that the peace has returned, the well-being, the trust, the love for those who have been with us and are no longer with us has not diminished. And my conviction that we will one day be together is very comforting. But sometimes I say, what if none of it was true? What if at the end, you know, you die and they put you into the ground and it's over? I still will have been so grateful to have lived with this faith. I believe it is true. I believe absolutely. I do too. But, <laughs> but I love what you've shared there. That's so profoundly well, moving. And what a great way to end our time together today in terms of that wonderful testimony that through him and through our faith, we're able to go through those terrible trials in our life, but also the joy and the good cheer that yes. we talked about before. Exactly. That, that also is what our faith in Christ brings. We are life. fantastic. <laughs> we are fantastic. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana. Thank you for watching Women Read Scripture. We hope to hear from you. Please write your comments below. Also, subscribe to our channel. We hope to see you again.